Assalamu alaikum and welcome to part 3 and in the part 3 I will jump right into how did it happen that I changed from the hardcore Salafi that I was to the anti or anti uh, Salafi that I have become the truth of the matter is from my early days in Islam I always I'm not one type of person that takes anything even in the Quran, if something doesn't ring true to me, I will refuse it, I will research it until I uh, learn it, I know about it, things like that. If I don't, I will reject it, even if it's in the Quran. And I'll give you an example. Allah, they say, in the Quran there is an ayah that says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have only sent you as a mercy to the worlds. All right. But when we see al Islam and women, how they are abused and how the hands are cut and people are decapitated, and when you look at the history and how what took place, we don't see mercy in this. So now a question comes in Is this the real meaning of the ayah, or was this ayah added to boost the status of the Prophet Muhammad? Because how is it? The Quran is valid to all time and all places, right? Yeah, all right. So how is the Prophet Muhammad today a mercy to everything, which means he is a mercy to your computer. He is a mer because Allah Rabbul Alameen, Allah is the Lord of the worlds. It means he is the Lord of the trees, of the sharks, of the cats, of planes, of computers, of pictures, of everything. Allah is the Lord. Yes, that's true. He created them. He's the Lord, right? So when you come and tell me that Muhammad, the messenger, is a mercy to all the worlds, which means he's a mercy to your pitch tree, or he is a mercy to your dress, or to your car, how is that possible? How can a human being be a mercy to something he never met? So when I did the research, I found out that this ayah couldn't be part of the Quran. Why? Because in the Quran, Allah has ordered the Prophet Muhammad to do certain things that go against mercy. So now, how is that? So to me, on my Quran, I have striked, I have put a line on this ayah that it is not part of the Quran. On Judgment Day, let's assume for an argument's sake that it is part of the Quran. On Judgment Day, when Allah tells me, why did you cross that ayah? I can argue my case. I would say, Ya Allah, here you said this, this, this. And this is not, not part of the mercy. Because you said that Muhammad is a mercy to man, to all the worlds. Which means he is a mercy to the smallest fish in the deepest ocean. How is that possible? How can he be? If you tell me that Muhammad is a mercy to Al-Alamin, to the worlds... How can he be a mercy to the moon? How can he be a mercy to the stars? How can he be a mercy to Jibril? How? You see what I mean? So I have that very speculative, very uh, uh, challenging mind that doesn't accept anything. In my early days when we were learning, I used to have problems. For example, they would say something. The sheikh is teaching us something. And then he says something. And I go, yeah, but this contradicts what you said earlier on. And I used to always end up, not in argument, but in a heated discussion with the sheikh, because they contradict each other. And I will give you an example. All school of thoughts disagree usually about when you enter a mosque after an asr prayer, should you pray to rak'at to salute the masjid or not? Why? Because there is a hadith that says whenever you enter the masjid, it is a sunnah to pray to rak'at. Okay. And on the other hand, we have a hadith that says there is no salat between Asr and Maghrib. No salat. So one hadith says you should pray to rak'at. The other hadith says you shouldn't pray. The Salafis, they say, it still is a sunnah. When you enter to the masjid, you pray to rak'at. So what do we do with the hadith that says there is no salat? They go, oh, but this hadith here, but this salat for the masjid after Asr is an exception. But who told you it's an exception? Or they say, oh, the messenger prayed them. So if the messenger prayed the two rak'at after Asr, isn't he part of those who say what they don't do? And Allah not only hates, but Allah despicably hates 
anyone who says something and they do the opposite it doesn't that mean they go no and they go why is no because Allah has said it in a general step you, see, you can see how they, they argue then they find an answer and they give them another answer if they find something and they give them if this uh, Malik Imam Malik is he knowledgeable aren't they hadiths that praise him they go yes well Imam Malik says it is haram to pray to rak'at after uh, asr in the masjid and you say you can who should I listen to Okay, and, and then I started seeing all this. Uh, and then the sheikhs, when they don't answer, they always accuse me of being a troublemaker. Why can't I just shut up and accept? And I go, no, I shouldn't shut up. Uh, uh, one day, and this really did me, he goes, oh, the etiquette of sleeping with your wives. And I go, etiquette of sleeping with my wives? What do you mean with my wives? together separate he goes not separate I said okay he goes at the time of the orgasm you make this dua I said to him but the human brain cannot do two actions at the same time it's either you are orgasming or you're making a dua it can't happen both of them and, you, and if you're uh, having sex with your partner and your brain goes away for a split of a second it breaks the cycle and it kills the energy he goes no and, and this is what started it. He goes, no, the dua is more important than orgasm. I said, then you are asking us to go against what Allah, the nature that Allah created in us. And then I started seeing those cracks. And in my mind, if Allah is one, and if the messenger is one, and if the Quran is one, why do we have all these differences? What, what, where is the problem? And, I, and at the back of my mind, I always had this thing. So one day in one of the talks, he said, the messenger of Allah prohibited eating from the left. You know, all the haram, haram, haram. I said to the sheikh, uh, to the teacher, yes, sheikh, I said, <laughs> yes, I feel sorry for those sheikh. I said, yes, sheikh, if Allah in the Quran says, وَمَا نُرْسِلُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا مُبَشِّرُونَ Allah says, and when we send messengers, we only send them as bringers of good news or as warners. And I said that in another ayah, Allah talking to Muhammad specifically, and he goes, and we only send you as a warner or bringer of good news. I said, if Allah has stated the job uh, description of these messengers that they only bring the good news about the hereafter, you do good, now you get rewarded later and you enjoy life later, or they warn you. They are not here to legislate and make halal al haram, especially that Allah has mentioned in the Quran that only Him has the authority to prohibit or allow. I said, Why has Al Islam become the messenger of Allah said and not Allah said? And the Sheikh said, Well, because the Sunnah, I said, But the Quran. Before the death of the messenger, Allah sent down the ayah that today I have completed your religion and have perfected it for you and have perfected my bounty of the religion upon you and agreed al Islam to be your religion. I said, if Allah has completed al Islam and terminated his favor upon the believers and agreed the Al Quran and is pleased with al Islam, as at that time there is our religion. I said, how come we wait 200 years and a half in the third century and we add other things and we attribute them to the messenger and they become part of Islam? I said, then if this is the truth, why, do we, why are we laughing on Christians who after the death of Jesus, 300 years later, they adopted the four canonical Bibles? Matthew, John, and... Why? I said, how, how is that? And then the more questions I asked, the more they try kind of like to sell me potatoes, like try to convince me, and was they could try to convince me, I come from the other angle, from the other angle. And then one day I said to myself, I'm going to take it upon myself now and learn the history, not, not, not how they collected the hadith, the science as they call it, now the history behind the hadith. And when I started reading, my eyes were so open. It's almost like I was um, what, uh, a zombie with big eyes. 
ready to, to eat at your neck and, and, and drain your blood away. One, I found that there are historical hadith narratives, historical, not legislative, historical, that state that Abu Bakr had forbidden any writing of the hadith. Oh, it's authentic. The chain of narrative is authentic. I said, yeah. And then I found out that uh, Omar and Abu Bakr had asked the people who had written what the Prophet did, uh, the, other than the Quran, and they asked the people, they said, anyone who has got something written, please bring it to us. People were thinking of being rewarded. Abu Bakr and Omar put all those works and they set them on fire. They burnt every book. And they go, oh. And then I found other uh, companions that prohibited the writing of hadith. Even in Al-Bukhari, there is a clear statement from the messenger who prohibits the writing of hadith. And I go, oh, really? Huh. And then I started looking, okay, that is the case. And I started now on Abu Huraira. And, and this is mind-boggling. Abu Huraira, the reason why they call him Abu Huraira, Huraira is the is a endearment term for a kitten. It's almost like say, uh, the father of a kitten. He owns a kitten. Do you know why they call him Abu Huraira? Because they don't have his real name. The scholars of Hadith disagreed about the identity of Abu Huraira up to... 40 different names. La ilaha illallah. Abu Huraira, we don't know his name. And that there are 40 different names. Ha, ha, ha. How is he now the biggest narrator of hadith? When, are you ready? Al Hassan, the grandchild of the messenger of Allah. Do you know how many hadiths they have reported on him? Three. Abu Huraira in the thousands, over 5,000 hadiths by Abu Huraira. Al Hassan, the grandchild, the grandchild who grew up with the messenger, only three. Worst, Al Hussein, none. And Al Hussein died when he was almost 60 years of age. Al Hassan was over 45, he was in his 50s when he was killed. How come the grandchildren of the messenger? The kids of Al uh, Fatima, one of them three hadiths, the other one none. And then I, st I started scratching my head. How come? Ali, who is the first to have embraced Al Islam, not Abu Bakr, maybe Khadija, but, uh, but in the world of male, Ali is the first to have embraced Al Islam, and he was a young kid. And he was living with the messenger in his house because the messenger was adopting him because the father of Ali was poor. And you know, Ali is the uncle of the messenger because Ali is the brother of Abdullah, the father of Muhammad. And I go, Ali who grew up with the messenger in Mecca. 13 years, he witnessed everything in Mecca. Ali, after the prophet flee to al Madina, Ali is the young man who migrated from Mecca to al Madina and he took the daughters of the messenger with him. It's Ali who did it. Ali who lived uh, the, the wall of his house is shared between him and the messenger, i.e. the messenger on one end and the Ali is on the other end, i.e. when the messenger comes out from his door he can enter the other door, that's where Fatima is. I.e. Ali was in direct contact with the messenger every single day. You know how many hadiths he gets in Al-Bukhari? About 22 hadiths. The number, the total number of hadiths by Ali don't go over a hundred. Here is another thing that triggered uh, my curiosity to start looking in the history of how hadith was compiled. Fatima, uh, the beloved daughter of the messenger, right? Why aren't there any hadiths that said that she had a good relationship with Aisha. None. Or any other wife of the messenger. But specifically Aisha. Why did Aisha hate the gods of Fatima? 
The Salafis don't tell you this, but the Salafi know this because they are in the Hadith in Bukhari in Muslim. The problem with Muslims today is they defend the Bukhari, 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 but they never read what's in Bukhari. They defend the concept as a whole, but they never tipped inside. Why is it Aisha that, and this is in Sahih Muslim, in our books, I'm not telling of Shia, I'm telling in our Hadith, authentic books, Aisha used to hate Ali so much so that she would refuse to utter his name. And it's in our books of Hadith, Muslim. Aisha. Why? Why? Why is it that the Salafis don't tell us authentic historical narratives which the Shia are barking over and over and over and over and with the Salafi, no, 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 no. When in fact it's, yes, 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 yes. yes. Why don't the, our Sheikh the Salafi tell us that when the Messenger of Allah died, Fatima, the daughter of the Messenger, was deprived from the wealth of her father. She didn't get a penny after it. And because of her anxiety and the fear and the problems, she had uh, she died earlier, uh, very very early. And of course, they lied the hadith after that that the messenger of Allah told her, "Come, I'm going to tell you something." And he told her something, and she cried. And then he told her something else, and she laughed. And then when she was asked, then she goes, "Oh, uh, I cried because he told me he was going to die." Huh? The messenger of Allah knows his death. <laughs> possible they will tell you Allah tells you but no Allah says that death comes to us without us knowing where it's gonna hit us that is of course if we don't kill somebody but normally like this naturally we don't know and then they say oh and the messenger of Allah told Fatima that she will be the first one to join him to die after him in less than six months and then she was happy yeah I'm gonna die I'm gonna die who on earth gets happy when they say they're gonna die you see, all these lies, and I go, whoa. I, and then I started digging a little bit into, a little bit into, and then I found out the main reason Salafis exist today. Salafis are the personification, I, they bring to reality all the conflict that took place in the early days of Islam. They lied to us. They say the best of generation are my people, i.e. the people of Rasulullah. The Quran has strictly said that of the companions of the messenger, for the companions, let me tell you, uh, all right. Al-Madina, Al-Madina had 5,000, at the death of the messenger, they had approximately 5,000 uh, of the origin of Al -Mad the Madinians, the people of Al-Madina, the, 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 the Al-Ansar, the supporters, the people of, uh, the original people of Al-Madina, at the death of the messenger, they were 5,000, okay. The people who came, who migrated from Mecca to Al-Madina, they were about 100. And as the, towards the end, before the death of the messenger, about 2,000 other people after the conquest of Mecca entered the Islam. At the time of the death of the messenger, Muslims weren't more than 15,000. We're not in the hundreds of thousands as they say we were. But why the lies? Why the lies? If the best people, as they say, are the best people, why was Ali? hated by Abu Bakr, by Omar, and by Uthman, and by many other people, namely Muawiyah, Abu Sufyan, things like that. You see, they created a historical embargo around what took place at that time, especially the household of the messenger, and they attributed them to the Shia. So the moment I start talking about Ali, people will tell you, oh, he is a Shia. And because I don't want to be labeled as Shia, I better not talk about Ali. If you talk about Al Hassan and Al Hussein, people are going to point at you. They go, "You are Shia." So I don't want people to talk about me. So I keep quiet. If I start talking about Fatima, they're going to say, "Ha ha, you are Shia." And then I don't want to talk about Fatima. Now, what's the alternative? I start praising Banu Umayyah, the first dynasty, even though we know that Mu uh, Muawiyah is the first to have destroyed the Khilafah. It's not the English. 
It's Muawiyah, and he turned it into a kingdom. And then it went on for thousands of years until our times. The first to have destroyed Al Islam and turned it into a kingdom is Muawiyah. 40 years, 40 years after the death of the messenger. Why was Uthman, why was Uthman killed? They tell you, oh, some people just killed Uthman out of... No, they lied to us. Uthman was killed because he favored Banu Umayyah. He favored Muawiyah. He favored so many people and he distributed wealth unequally and unjustly with his family. He gave to his family. And then he did another big mistake. When he... With, with big tyranny took all the parts of the Quran and changed them and he made one book and he said this is the Quran any other book is not the Quran Abdullah ibn Mas'ud famous Abdullah ibn Mas'ud hated Uthman and was against Uthman even oh, I will talk about this when I speak about the Quran Ubay ibn Ka'b one of the great people that the messenger said take your Quran from him also was in a huge argument. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, the poor guy, was in a confrontation. He was in a huge problem against Uthman and Muawiyah. And Uthman expelled Abu Dhar out of al Madina because of one letter in Al-Quran, because Abu Dhar was the man who saw that having uh, treasures in Al-Islam is prohibited by the text of Al-Quran. Uthman and Muawiyah didn't want that. They kicked him out. Of course, all the hadiths later on that the faith of Abu Bakr, if you put it in a scale, it will outweigh all the Muslims, is a complete rubbish. How can one man, out, if, how can Abu Bakr outweigh the belief of Ali, or al Hassan or al Hussein or Fatima? Are you kidding me or what? It's, it's strange, but why did they put those hadiths to reinforce the authenticity and the leadership of Abu Bakr? Abu Bakr, when you go to history, he became a Khalifa because of what Omar has done. Nothing to do with the people. You see, the way Al-Islam is portrayed to us by the Salafis is they say, oh, ever, the messenger was so much loved. Whenever he commanded, whatever he commanded, people were ready. They were ready to die for him. Rubbish. The Quran says the, the opposite of that. And that's why the Quran is always, always, always left behind. Because Wallahi al-Azim, I swear to you, if I, if, if I gave the books of hadith to a movie maker in Hollywood, and I gave him the Quran, and I will tell him, make me a movie, and I give him the topic about the people that surrounded the messenger, the companions as they call them. And I say, make a movie about these people from the hadith and from the Quran. I swear to you, that the films will be complete contradiction with each other. Allah in Al-Quran speaks about the companies as hypocrites. They have sexual perversion and I've already made a talk about that. That these people are liars, that they say what they don't do, that they are lazy in the prayer, that they are shayateen, that they are, they are, they are al uh, fasiq uh, dissolute, the dis Allah has spoken about the companions. If you take 5,100 of them, maybe 50 of them are good. And that's why the Shia, they say, all the, of course, they went to the other extreme, and they say they are kuffar. We don't go to the kuffar land here. But the companions are not the angels. For example, they, the, Abdullah ibn Abbas, the Salafis know this, but they don't tell you. Abdullah ibn Abbas stole money from the house, like the central bank. Yes, he was a leader in Al-Iraq, and then when he got kicked out of that, he stole money and ran away with it. Strange, isn't it? I can tell you stories, and I will do it, inshallah, in time. Wallahi, you will scratch your head. And, and when I discovered these things, I go, heck with it, what's this Salafism? And then, one day, the sheikh was again in one of our classes, and I started already having these doubts, and, I, and I'm, uh, these doubts started with me in... Um, in the early 90s. So at one point, uh, the hadith, and he said, and he said this, that the Quran and the hadith and the sunnah are 
uh, text from Allah, their legislation. I said, no. I said, the entire Quran speaks about Allah descends the Quran, one book. Allah always speaks about his revelation as one. I said to him, either the Quran and the Hadith are one revelation, and in which case the Hadith collected 300 year, years later, and the texts of the Quran are equal. Or they are not equal, and then they are a pair, and in which case, why isn't Allah talking about them as a, in a pair? And I said to him, what do we do when the Quran doesn't agree with the Hadith? Here is what he said. He goes, Ya Abdul Salam. He goes, not everything is as you see it, black and white. I said, come and explain to me. I said, for example, Allah in Al-Quran, times after times after times after times, says that he created heavens and earth in six days. Right? Not as the Jews six days, but six days. The hadith says seven days. It's impossible. One of the two is lying. It's either the Quran or the hadith. Of course we know it's not the Quran. It's got to be the hadith. If that is the case, why do the sheikhs still insist that the hadith is authentic? Why? It contradicts the Quran right head on. How? And then, uh, it's argument over an argument over an argument. And then one day, <laughs> I told him, yeah, Sheikh, Salafism is the bodification, i.e. The, the, the manifestation of deviance of Islam. If there is an enemy, sworn enemy of the Quran, that's Salafism. He goes, wow. And I said, yes. I said to him, the Jews, are we allowed to follow them? Because no, as long as the Quran. I said to him, okay, I'm going to go with that. I said, why in Arabic, the first day of the week is called Ahad? And the Jewish first day of the week is called also Ahad. Because the Jews, Ahad means one, the first. I said, because the Jews believe that the creation started on Sunday. And they have Ithnain in Arabic. Ithnain is the second day of the week. And also the, the, the Jews have Ithnain. The Arab has have Ithnain. The second day of creation. The Jews have third, three. The Arabs have Thulatha. Thulatha is the third day of creation. Arbi'ah from Arba'ah, from four. Fourth day of creation. Al-Khamis, Khamsa, is fifth day of creation. Why is it in the Muslim calendar? And then we have Jumu'ah. And they have Friday which is the sixth day of creation. I told him, if that is the case, the Jews say that Allah created the heavens and earth and everything in six days, and on the seventh day, he took a rest. He got tired, he rested. And that's why the Jews observed the Shabbat. Sabbath. He goes, yes, that's what they say. And, he, and then he told me, and Allah has cursed them in the Quran for their doing. I said, I'm happy you said that. I said, why do the Arabs have their seventh day Sabbath. Why do they call it the same way the Jews call it? Sabbat, Shabbat, Sabbat. Why? We shouldn't have it on our calendar. And he looked at me as if I told him, Al-Bukhari, uh, sorry, as if I told him the messenger of Allah used to be a smoker. <laughs> I said, why is it in our calendar? Why do we have it? The examples are many. The reason why I switched and I become 100% Qur'ani, as they love to call me, is because if a Sunni takes pride of being a Sunni, why should I feel ashamed of being a Qur'ani? Is it, why do they get angry when I say Qur'an, Qur'an? Why do they get angry? Hasn't Allah said in Al-Qur'an that those people who have problem with the Qur'an are hypocrites? So I said to them, you Salafis are hypocrites. Because you say the Quran and the Sunnah, and I am sorry, they cannot coexist because Allah has said it's the Quran and the Quran only, and the Quran has so many ayahs that is incredible. And then I got hit by the idea of obedience. Allah wa Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And I told them, okay, what is he? What is the Messenger now to obey him? He goes, no, now that the Messenger is dead. We must obey what he said. I said, wrong. Allah didn't say that. It's like when you are in the army and you are a captain and they tell you, 
in the ranks of hierarchy ranks, you obey the general. All right. As long as the general is alive, I obey him. And as long as I am in the army, I obey him. But should I carry on obeying the general when he's dead? No, he's dead. How can I obey? And even if, let's say the general before his death gave an instruction, right? For example, he goes always on Monday, uh, clean guns. That's his instruction. And that general's instruction is good and the army adopts it. And they make it a law, a general X law. Every Monday, clean the guns. All right? So every Monday when I clean the, uh, the, the guns, am I obeying the general or following his instruction? I'm following his instruction. To obey somebody, he has to be alive. A child obeys their parents. Is when they are with them and the parents tell them do and they obey. If the child is away from the, uh, the parents and the parents tell him to do something, he follows the instruction. There is a difference between following the instruction and obedience. When Allah ordered the messenger Muhammad to follow in the pathway of the messenger Ibrahim, Allah didn't tell him obey Ibrahim. He told him what tabia? Follow what Allah, what Allah. The sheikhs, and this is a huge problem. In the past centuries, the normal people, let's say in Iraq or anywhere in the Muslim world, go to the Muslim world, for example, if you go to Egypt or you go to Algeria or Tunisia or Morocco, this country, the Muslim countries, illiteracy, people not knowing how to read, the number is huge. Huge. They can't read and write. So these people who couldn't read and write, they relied solely and heavily on what the sheikh said. The sheikh said all kinds of stupidities. People cannot, I cannot go back to them. So it passes. But today, today, I read, when I read in Al-Bukhari that when uh, revelation stopped, which it didn't stop, but anyhow, the, when they say when the revelation stopped, the messenger would go to the top of the mountains to commit suicide. Hey, yo, what kind of man is this? Commit suicide? Commit suicide, is this what it is? When Aisha says the messenger of Allah used to kiss me and suck my tongue, would you, how would you feel if somebody came to you and says, oh, your, your, your dad and mom used to kiss and they used to suck each other? Yeah, I don't need to know these things, it's none of my business. But why is it when the messenger gets down? They tell you Allah protects the messenger. And then they tell you the messenger died poisoned. Ha! The poison incident took here three years ago. How is it that he dies with it today? How come, how come the <laughs> poison's effect stays in the body for three years? Well, people in this first century, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, blah, 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 would believe such nonsense. But to us today, no, science says impossible. If poison doesn't kill you now, it will never kill you. Maybe it damages your liver or things like that, but hey, it will kill you. But to us, in the books of fiqh before, they say, oh God, in the books of fiqh before, they say, uh, jurisprudence, or halal, haram, and things like that, they say a woman can remain pregnant with a kid in her stomach Four years, four, one, two, three, four. Never heard of this before. But it's in our books. And the sheikhs today still believe in that nonsense. Still believe in that nonsense. Here's another question. To, uh, that is something that really infuriates you of this Islamic stupidity of the sheikhs and the humans, of course. It's this. A question gets sent to a sheikh, and believe me, this is in Saudi Arabia High Council of Ulama. They say this, and if you ask a sheikh, they will say the answer. They will, if you tell them, look, ya sheikh, someone, <laughs> someone said to them, ya sheikh, I married a woman whose husband has been gone for over 20 years, assumed dead. All right. And I have three kids with her. Fine. One day, out of the blue, the husband turns up and is alive. What should we do? 
Now pay attention, please. This man is married to this woman for 20 years. I hear the time before the marriage, the woman has done her idda, that she had more than reasonable doubt that the husband is dead. All right. Now he's telling him that the man has turned up. And he says, that's my wife. The Sheikh and the High Council in Saudi Arabia and the Salafi and the Sunni and the, and the Shia and the other, everybody gives the fatwa as follows. The woman is still the wife of the first one. Uh huh. As if this was not enough, now come the second part. And the children that the second husband has had with the wife, they are not his children. They are the children of the first man and are considered as such under the Islamic law. You got it right, yes. What, uh, let me put it a little bit different, yeah? Let's say uh, some woman is married to a man and the man for a reason is a sailor in the ocean. Uh, he didn't come back for two years. Uh, we ask around, the man uh, more than likely is dead and eaten by the fishes. All right, and then I go and fall in love with this woman and ask for her hand and everything is fine. We get married, ja -la 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 -la. 20 years later, we still married, happily married together and we have three kids. Hey, well, at least the, the eldest of the, ki the kids is, let's say, 15, 16. All right, and then one day we are happy, dancing at the home, and then we hear... You go and open the door and you see this old man by the door and you go, hello, they go, salam alaikum, alaikum salam. Uh, I am X, Y, Z, the husband of that woman. You're the husband of my wife? You? He goes, yes. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, he didn't die? No. And, and then him and I and his wife, we go, uh, and, the, and the woman, we go to the sheikh, to the highest council in Saudi Arabia, full of scholars, to the brim. They, it's going to explode, all kinds of sheikhs and scholars. And, all that. and we put the case in forward. And the answer is one, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Algeria, anywhere you go, the answer is the same. It's as follows. The woman is not my wife, but the man's wife, the first wife. <gasps> what? And the kids, how about the kids? These are my children, they have my DNA. No, they are not regarded as yours. These are his children. But he doesn't have my DNA. He, they have nothing of my children. Nope, it's his children. Is this the Quran? Is this how Allah? But that is not how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about that. But anyhow, that's, that's, uh, that's the Islam we got. But anyhow, and then I learned that Banu Umayyah, that Muawiyah had employed, was the first one to have created a ministry of religious affairs. He was the first one who used the sheikhs to push for his agendas. Muawiyah, the first king, uh, who is uh, the, the head of killing Ali, and Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, and uh, he's from the family. He's the child of Abu Sufyan the leader of Quraysh against the Prophet Muhammad and Hind, two sworn enemies of the messenger. But anyhow, and then I learned that uh, Muawiyah was the first man to have recruited 10,000 sheikhs. He used to pay them monthly uh, wages as long as they kept the people occupied that they preached in Islam a very... If you say a hundred times, subhanAllah, Allah forgives your sins. To occupy people with subhanAllah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. Uh, tell people that when they attend the salat early, they will get more rewards. When you go to Jum'ah first, it's like you've given a camel. Really? And then people would go as early, five, six hours to do what? Sit in the masjid. Why did Muawiyah do that? Simple. Because Muawiyah had had over a hundred revolts against him. So many wars and battles, people did not accept him as a leader. So the best way to control the masses is to keep them in the masjid. So that's why, would you know? Wallahi al-Azim. But I will tell you more about this in details and with the evidence and everything. In the, early, in the days of Banu Umayyah, especially at the time of Muawiyah, the first king. And, and of course, they tell you Muawiyah is, is the companion. May Allah be pleased with him. It's the most cursed person. And I am not a Shia, but he's the most cursed person. Because once you know 
the authentic historical facts reported by our sheikhs like Ibn Kathir, Tabari, Zahabi uh, and few others, you will bang your head against the wall. Yes, against the wall. 10,000 sheikhs to preach in the land. They were the media of Muawiyah. They used to get money. Why? Do this, you get that. Say subhanallah wa bihamdi, subhanallah al-azim, you get a tree in the, in the paradise planted. Really? Isn't Allah going to weigh your actions on judgment day and then reward you? Automatically you do it now, it gets there. So what's start judgment day for then? And then, the, the, but anyhow, I'll tell you this thing. Muawiyah to occupy the people, they went and invaded countries. And they used to take money out of the people to the uh, central bank of the Banu Umayyah. But anyhow, so when I know the impact of how uh, Muawiyah had distorted Al-Islam and created a virgin parallel to Al-Islam and abandoned Al-Quran and the group of sheikhs that helped Muawiyah in his uh, mischievous acts are what's called today Salafis. A Salafi is nothing else but an old injury, an old betrayal of the people of Quraysh against the messenger of Allah, against Islam, that is still alive today. Yes. Do you think that Allah uh, tells a Muslim five days, uh, five times a day, go to the masjid and pray, and you pray sunnah before, and then you pray the salat, and you pray sunnah before? All these are invented by Banu Umayyah, by Muawiyah. Why? To keep people in the masjid. Think of it this way. And what Banu Umayyah used to do, Muawiyah, well, this is what they used to do. You pray in the masjid, your salat at home is not valid. These sheikhs and the guards and all that used to stand in the doors. When you walk in, the, I'm, what I'm going to tell you, you're going to think it's like it's fiction, but it's not. It's in our books of history. It's documented. When you go to the masjid or when someone goes to the masjid, you find a guard by the door. They have a Quran or, or you hold your hand or you swear by Allah. And you swear three times by Allah and you also swear that your wife is divorced. If you are lying, that, for example, you're going to go for dhuhr, yeah? That you will swear by Allah that you have not prayed dhuhr at home. Oh, really? And that dhuhr you're going to pray in the masjid, you're not going to repeat it when you go home. Do you know why? Because simply put, Banu Umayyah had changed as salat. In the early days of Islam, as salat was two rak'at, two rak'at, two rak'at till the end. Until they changed it. All what you recite loudly in a salat, that's the prescribed salat. Anything silent you read in your salat is a human added salat. And people today are like idiots. They tell you, ah, if the Quran by itself is enough, how do you know how many the rak'at you pray there? Because you're an idiot. You don't read. You're like a parrot. You just monkey see, monkey do. You never use the faculty of your brain. Because when you go for maghrib, to rak'at loud, and that's, you read al-Fatiha and you read the Quran behind it, right? Good. Why number three, you just wing al-Fatiha and you do it quick? Why were any salat you read, the first two rak'at are always the longest? Why are the two, uh, the other one two? If the salat is four rak'at, why don't we all pray the same thing? Why, Aisha, we don't four, pray the four rak'at loud? It's one salat. How come one salat half silent, half... Uh, why? Well, it's simple. Because the original salat is what you read loud. Anything beyond that, is added. I have been praying Fajr, Maghrib, and Isha two rak'at only for years now. Years. Years. Because that's the salat. And if you pray Isha two rak'at loud and two rak'at uh, uh, silent, <laughs> you're kidding yourself. It's one salat. How, ca how can it be? <clears throat> By now, you get the, the point. So now they use a fake historical Invention and they use it to discredit the Quran. If Allah has taken time to explain to us how we perform wudu in a salat, 
if Allah has taken time to mention that when we enter home, we say, we, we greet ourselves. Yeah, and Allah calls it tahiyya mubaraka. I.e., when you enter your home and there is nobody at home, say, say something good to yourself, greet yourself. I enter my home. And I say, Salaamu Alaikum, Abdul Salam. And I answer, Alaikum Salam. Sometimes I enter home and I go, Welcome back home, Ya Abdul Salam. I pray to Allah to grace this home of yours. And I say, uh, Ya Rabb, please accept. I greet. My, and Allah has told us to do that in the Quran. Okay, right? And do you think Allah would forget how to tell us how many rak'at we pray in Salat? The reason he didn't tell us why is because it was known. Everybody knew it. Do you know why? Because we are praying the way Abraham prayed. Abraham didn't pray five times a day. Allah has ordered Muhammad to pray as Abraham did. But Muawiyah and our sheikhs of before have twisted that Islam. Every sheikh you know today, every sheikh you know today, is a sheikh of the third century. Sometimes when you read in the hadith, they tell you, uh, Al-Bukhari says, the messenger of Allah said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is rubbish. In the early days of Islam, none of them said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the messenger. None of them said, peace be upon you. This peace be upon you rubbish came in the third century, used by the Arab Muslims to boost the status of Muhammad. So that's all. Jesus, Isa, alayhi salam. But Muhammad upon him is the salat. As if the salat of Allah upon Muhammad is something of miraculous. It's not. Allah has done the same thing to us. And we're not making a big fuss of it. I've never heard someone tell me, Ya Abdul Salam, may Allah have mercy, peace be upon you. Never. Even though Allah has said the same thing about me. You see what I mean? The, the, the Quran is, uh, has made the marrying many wives based on orphans. They changed. Muawiyah came and his goons and they changed it. And now anyone, the Salafi people, they marry four, three, two, one. This is halal. Really? Where does it say that? Anyhow. So my sisters and my brothers, the wake up call to me was when I realized that the Islam followed today. That the Salafi Islam, any hadith you know today, any tafsir you know today, any scholar you know today, are A, manufactured after the third century. The only thing that's not manufactured in the third century is the Quran. And that's why, go back to the Quran. What is in Al Quran is enough. If someone tells you, oh, so, for example, as zakat every year is a headache. Has it reached the nisab? Huh? How much is gold? How much? All this is rubbish. It's nonsense. They will tell you, oh, if the Quran is enough by itself, how do you know how much we pay zakat? You don't need to know how much. What Allah has done, He left it to you to decide how much you spend. Hey, guess what? If I am a poor person and I want to pay some money, to purify myself, to raise my status. That's what zakat is, to raise your status. Then guess what? I pay. And I don't pay 2.5%. Because if you go if you go to someone who has a hundred million uh, in the bank and you tell them pay 2.5%, it's nothing big. But if you go to somebody who is broke, poor, and they only got a hundred pounds in their pocket, that's, and it, it will take them 15 days to go to the end of the month. And you ask them to pay some, some money to help if they want, if they want to purify themselves and raise their stats. And they go, oh my God, 2.5%. Oh, it's too much for me. I don't have money. So, you see what I mean? What Allah is saying is this. I leave it to you. Donate whatever you feel will raise your status, will make you feel good about yourself. Sometimes I have money in my pocket and if I give five pounds, ten pounds, it's nothing big. But if I give 50 pounds out of my pocket, oh God, I feel it, right? <laughs> give until you feel it. That's it. I don't need the 2.5% and I don't need the sheikh. These sheikhs are employed. Their job is to be a sheikh. And I find it really ironic and very disturbing that the sheikh stands on Juma and gives a khutbah about how we shouldn't love life, how we shouldn't run after life, how we should concentrate about our hereafter, 
And while he's saying all that, he's being paid. He's sheikh. He's get, he gets paid to say that. While I leave my work to go listen to him, and I am not paid. So in the balance of justice, who is running after the life? And this is the problem with these sheikhs today. They get paid to sell us rubbish. And we listen to them while we are not being paid. My biggest eye-opener is history. Once I knew history, and once I realized that every sheikh, every scholar you know today, was a, an, a lie, was a pro Banu Umayyah, pro Muawiyah, pro the Abbasi dynasty, and that's why they were brought to the forefront. When I knew that, I wore my binoculars and I became extremely critical of everything because it's my brain and my hereafter. And this is why uh, the distortion that Salafism has brought to Islam is incredible. So much so that women to be extremely Salafism. She'll cover herself from head to toes and she looks like a Jew. Not much difference between her and a Jew. Just as much as there is not much difference between a Jewish man, an Orthodox, and a Salafi person. They both have long beards. They, have, uh, they wear Orthodox, things like that. What I'm trying to say, my dear sisters and my brothers, after this long journey, and I'm sorry it's long, and believe me, it's, but it's just too much, too much to say. And I want you to feel safe and secure that I am not just one of the people out there who started talking yesterday or 10 years ago. My journey has been since a little bit 86, 85, 86, 87 of those. And it's, uh, I've told you, uh, and I've, I've kept away a lot more and things like that, so that you feel safe at what I propose. Because at the end of the day, what I say in my talks is what I 100% believe in. But what I do is I invite you to look at another topic from a different angle. Maybe what I say makes more sense. Maybe it brings more opening. Maybe it brings more joy. Maybe it brings more... And from, the, uh, from what people have said and uh, from all the feedback and things like that, uh, people are extremely happy with the version uh, of Islam taken from the Quran. And that's because they should be. They should be. You don't need to feel any complex or any problems. Al-Quran has come to make it easy. And the day I understood this, it changed my life. And now I understand why Allah has decided not to send any other messenger after Muhammad or to send any other book after the Quran. It's because Al-Quran is the easiest of any book that Allah has ever descended. If Allah was to send another messenger, he will come and tell us, do as you please, you're going to go to paradise anyway. Because when Allah <laughs> descended the Quran, he prohibited few things. And those few things, if you do them, you'll, how much do we need that Allah has told us that if you avoid the major of what we forbade on you, which means to kill people or eat the wealth of others or cause mischief and oppression, transgression on earth and hurt people, things like that. Allah would say, if you avoid the big things that we have forbidden upon you, in the Quran, of course, we will forgive your small sins and we'll uh, admit you into paradise. We have a guarantee from Allah. Don't do the big things, the major, major things. And Allah will take you to paradise. There is no other simplicity than the Quran. That's why Allah said no more books out of the Quran. End of it. Because it's like a teacher in a classroom who tells the student, okay, I'm going to give you an exam in math and this one I'm going to make it easy. Okay, to pass your GCSE levels, 1 plus 1 equals, 2 minus 1 equals, 5 plus 2 equals, and this is at university level of studies, right? Now, this is so simple and so easy. If you tell him, can you please make it simpler? Well, he gives you the answers, that's it. And that's what the Quran is. Anyone who doesn't know history, anyone who listens to the sheikh without using their brains, will believe the stupidity of 
obey Allah is alive we obey him yes because he's still alive Allah doesn't die so obedience to Allah is true but Muhammad is dead why should I obey Muhammad when Allah tells us do not obey shaitan because shaitan is alive he doesn't die so Allah tells us do not obey him do not follow him but if someone is dead we don't obey them it's dead Muhammad was to be obeyed when he was alive because he was the representation of the Quran. He was the man who spoke with the law of Allah and the law of Allah was the Quran. That's why Allah said, they ask you, they ask you, say, 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 say. Muhammad is dead, we have the Quran. I don't want anyone to come and tell me obey Muhammad because I have this many times when they say, Allah says obey Allah and obey the messenger. I tell him I don't have a problem with that. What is the messenger to obey him? They go, oh, he is dead, but the hadith. I said, no, 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 no. Allah didn't say obey Allah and obey the messenger and when he dies, obey what he says. No, 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 no. Allah says I obey him. Bring him to me, I will obey him. And of course, that's not true. Otherwise, uh, the, otherwise, we might as well throw the Quran and go and do something else, become anything else. Because the Quran is a bunch of say nothing and means nothing and it's contradictory and heck with it all. That's why we need to go back to the Quran. I pray to Allah these, um, these stories uh, have kept you entertained. Now you have a better idea about myself. Of course, if you have questions, please do not uh, hesitate to contact me. And uh, uh, anything I said, I said in a good spirit of uh, not speaking about me for me, but speaking about me because of what I said, why I believe you should listen to what I got to say about uh, the distortions of Islam by the Salafi side, because you need to know who you are learning from, or at least, at least getting pointers from to go and do your own researches and reach your own conclusion. Uh, to end this, I'm working still on the topic of uh, beating women in Al-Quran and so far I have collected over 40 hadith narratives that not only degrade women but actually calls for abuse and home violence. Oh, there is, oh, that talk is going to be uh, the talk. I pray to Allah to help us all achieve the best of what we can achieve and forgive the evil that we have committed and help us against ourselves to not do evil stuff and we should stick to the Quran for in the Quran alone and alone is our salvation. I pray to Allah to bless you all. Again, this is your brother Abdul Salam uh, Ben Daud. And uh, may, you, uh, may you all have a wonderful time, life, and everything goes with it. Right? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.